Hi, welcome back to Drawing the Fantasy Female Figure, Metamorphosis, Part 2. Now, uh, where did we leave this? We left it at what I call the journey person stage. Everything's in place, but there's no sign of style yet. There's echoes somewhere and little oasises that would suggest style, like where the hands meet the wrist. But I could never say this is a finished drawing, not for my style, that is. Could be for someone else's. But when I look at this, it's an unfinished drawing. Now, how do I finish it within my style? That's what we're going to explore here. Let's get into it. All right, still working with that little pencil that has been beautifully sharpened through all of this time on the surface. So you can get yourself a pencil that's well honed through the actual use of it and becomes a much more refined instrument than basically sharpening it with a blade. And I'm using that to the max here and getting it in nice and close. This is the closest I've been to the actual pencil end and that gives me a detailed hand that is both gestural and precise without being detailed and stiff and non-gestural. So within this beautiful grip, I'm finding many beautiful gestures in a micro level. But I'm still turning the pencil to be on its flat and up on its point by pushing my fingers and knuckles into the surface. At that point, I needed to get in with the detail hand, and that'll happen every once in a while for a very fine line. But the sooner as I can get out of that, the better. Now look at how beautiful lines are in all their differences. Look at the thick broad end of the hair reaching the head and that makes us feel like there's a step down there that a fine line just wouldn't give us. We can hatch and that's a style but I'm using tone here and value. Remember value is just the grays. Tone is the dark of a color. So usually use tone with paint, a dark red tone and you value tinted with grays because we're continuing with only gray here and only darks then they can be confused so we're looking at values here of gray and tones of black look at the wonder of this edge of pencil and how much we can get out of such a simple instrument and i'm always amazed at that when I see someone work with a simple tool and get an incredible results from it and sophisticated ideas, what we're really looking at here, if we think about it, are dirty marks arranged to look like something else. Just a dirty piece of paper, but the dirt has been laid out so much that it creates an image and better than that, an emotion. Look at all these variations of that idea. I'm going from a core shadow into a drop shadow there. Very sophisticated idea. We think of the core and the drop being two separate things. Sometimes they become one thing. That's what I'm looking at. As the arm drops a shadow onto the breast, it also casts a core softness. Think of the core as the corner and it's a soft corner and a drop is a hard edge thing. There will be dropping a shadow off the breast there. And then it becomes a core shadow as it softens away from the initial drop point. So a hard edge near the object that's dropping the shadow and a softer edge as it curves around the form that it's dropping onto. Drop and form, drop and form. See so if you can practice that over and over. You don't need to necessarily do it on a full figure like this. You just try it with various abstract shapes. You can even zoom in just on what that is right now. The drop shadow zigzagging its way down the rib cage into the obliques. And just practice that over and over. So I'm working with a lot of core here. And I'm balancing these values. I'm doing holistic gestures throughout this flowing fantasy element of style on the human figure. So we considered 
the world of flow in the first stage of this, and now we're considering a world of fantasy based on that flow. Now, the flow through the figure, we have an audience that believes in this 100%. This is a fantasy female figure morphing into an insect. Now, finding that compression again. Compression is so important to me. It's very easy for this to look like it's a buoyant thing with air in it rather than flesh and bone. Got to be careful. So I'm very aware of that gluteus as it goes into that moment of pinch against the biceps femoris of the back of the leg. So the biceps femoris crushes against the gluteus and has that gluteal band on it as well. So it's tending to give us that double bump there because we've got two forms crushing against each other in a situation that it doesn't normally happen in, meaning rocking right back rather than forward because this creature that we are tends to sit down with feet on the floor and so the softest part of us is sitting on a seat. Here that's not the case. So Alana has rolled back away from that idea. It was a strange curve. Now here I'm exploring lots and lots of variation of line. And this is what you consider an element of style. There's many elements. The way you lay down tone, the way you lay down value, the way you lay down a line, the thickness of it, the thinness of it, where it disappears or gets so thin and faded that it becomes the idea of a lost edge. Now note how I put a dark line on that leg and how automatically the line that was previously there, which you can still see going up to the head there, looks automatically lighter without actually being lighter. It has not changed at all. What has changed is the visual difference between the darker line that went on and how that affected the line that remained. It really looked like we dialed the light up on something and without even touching it by contrast of the next thing. Note also how I got that beautiful line from the long head of the tricep down to rest on the medial epicondyle. That's often not seen in anatomy books. Anatomy books are very stiff and rigid and what they tend to do is just bring all of that stuff, all of the triceps to rest only on the ulna. But that triceps medius, no matter what it says in anatomy books, it rests against that medial epicondyle, the little curved bone that is closer to the body. Here it seems like it's on the outside only because we're looking from the side view. If the figure was standing straight up in front of us, that would be the inside view. So you can think of what's below from this view as the inside. So using the ever trusty little paper stump there to find a softer idea and also to get me out of detail. I've been in detail a long time there and this beautiful little stump gives me the idea of thinking like a painter again that this is now a big soft blender brush and I can start pushing some of that tone away. What I've noticed most about working with students in workshops is that they put too much charcoal down and they end up with a very dirty picture. What I'm doing here is pushing that stuff around and taking from somewhere that might have too much on it and putting it somewhere else. Therefore, I'm killing two birds with one stone. But the real benefit here is bringing back the gesture. Now, note how I can draw with this paper stump. I took some dirty charcoal from the darkness of the back of the head and started to draw with this stump. And by drawing with the stump we get a very big, bold and soft shape which is perfect for these gossamer wings. Now when you're starting out you might want to plot those wings out and draw them in very lightly and then go over them with a stump. But as you get more and more finessed, 
you'll find that that's a much better approach that I just took there. Because it's very easy to soften it all back again with a tissue and have another go. So I suggest not to draw it and try to embrace the idea of confidence, even if it's a false idea. Just tell yourself it's only a drawing, but it could be a beautiful thing. And if you tell yourself it has to be a beautiful drawing or a great drawing, then you're most likely going to fail. There's too much pressure on you then because you're thinking of something else, not the drawing. So be in the moment. Always be in the moment of drawing. And if you can divorce yourself from ego and tell yourself that this is a curved object and the shadow is being dropped here and I need to make that a little darker and a little curvier for the benefit of the whole drawing, now you're in the zone. You're in the world of art and you're thinking of nothing else but the art. Once you start thinking of ego, meaning this has to be the best thing ever, it doesn't have to be. Everything you do is taking you forward. And magically, it probably will be the best thing you've done, at least for this week and this time. It's the best thing you can possibly do in this time. So whatever level you're at, you're going to be at your best level when you embrace that idea of being in the moment. And practice, practice all the time. Look what I'm doing here. I'm finding the anatomy beyond the structure. So this is when we can look at the figure that we have in front of us for reference to find realism and find a little bit of realism in that arm. And it gives me a gnarlier idea than the flexor carpial narus rested against that medial epicondyle. It gives me Alana's particular muscle shape. It's still going to be in the same ballpark as anyone else's, but it could well be just particular to her. And you'll see that with Bodybuilders and gymnasts, you'll see that they have the same muscles, obviously, but some people have a high calf and some people have a lower calf and a particularly lumpy muscle here and there. And that's what we're getting there. The separation between the flexor carpial narus and the palmar longus underneath, if you have one. 15% of us don't have it. Just like the top of the ulna, I think carpi carpi, each edge of that ulna bone. At the bottom, on each edge of the medial apiconda, I find flexor flexor, flexor carpi radialis and flexor carpi ulnaris. And that's from underneath. So I'm exploring lots of turns of the forearm in all of these movies, because the forearm is the most difficult part of the anatomy after the hand to draw because of the radiation. The fact that that thumb can turn inwards, which it's doing right now. So if the thumb is toward the body, then you have a radiation. You have the radius bone crossing over the ulna bone to find that thumb. And coming over with it is the brachial radialis and the extensor carpi radialis, the twins. Everything else, of course, is affected with it. The extensor digitorum, the top, is going to be affected too. But that's the most that we're going to see as a change. And note how the highness of the brachialis is a higher ridge to the left, and the flexor carpial narus is a lower ridge down to the right. So we're going to diagonals to find these lumps, not in a bilateral way. We want a symmetry. And you can see it also in the biceps and the triceps. The tricep is swelling higher toward the insertion at the scapula. And the bicep is swelling lower in his insertion down onto the radius bone. So the kneadable eraser is a wonderful thing. It's one of my favorite, well it is my favorite eraser. Because once again it acts like paint. In reverse, I'm actually painting highlights on by taking away the charcoal, and that's how I like to think. I'm painting on the highlights. Get that in your mind. The word eraser is a very negative idea. It says that something's wrong and that you have to take it away. I'm adding with the eraser. See if you can get that mindset in. You want to sculpt with this eraser? 
you're going to create and draw with this eraser and look how beautiful that knee bone and the tibial nose all came together there with just a little squish and pull of that kneadable eraser so they're called kneadable erasers for a good reason if you think about bread you need bread to reshape it you need this eraser to reshape it as well and you can shape it right down to a fine point and you can see me wiggling around my thumb and finger that'll take a little bit of getting used to and a little bit of experimentation but after a while you won't even think about it it'll almost happen by itself your hand will know through lots of mileage what it needs next until you're not even thinking about the mechanics that is you're thinking about the drawing which is all important and look how I'm pushing in the rhythms as well I like to think rhythmic and really push the highlight up onto that drop shadow our optics give us that hard edge when we see a hard drop shadow the lightest point of whatever that is is going to be light right there and I learned that a long time ago watching a cartoonist draw a caricature and he kept hitting those lights right up against the drop shadows and it was amazing how they popped it was such a sculptural and beautiful idea and I now own that as part of my toolkit I wish I could remember the person's name to give them credit it was a wonderful experience to suddenly see out of nowhere and understand because a lot of the stuff that we see we think we're understanding it but for some reason we don't retain it the minute we do it and it clicks we understand what it is we're doing then it becomes part of the internal art engine that's very strong so when you feel that you're just erasing without thinking to see what happens sure experimentation is okay but basically you're getting more and more lost as you go now you saw me hit the edge of the brachial radialis group there and it left a little mark and I liked it and left it in so every once in a while let your drawing get a little bit rough let it do what it likes if you're constantly trying to hone it into something really beautiful ironically the opposite tends to happen it becomes stiff and there's the beauty once again of that dirty little paper stump and notice I rolled it between my thumb and finger as I dragged it see what you can pull out of these things look how the gestural hand allows me to pull downwards like a seamstress like a person that's pulling fabric or pulling thread and doing it all the way from our own shoulder down to the tip or the broad end of that beautiful paper stump be careful of the paper stump though it can seduce you and you can over blend and that's why you'll see me often do it for a while and then get back into the drawing again and that helps me once again with a holistic nature of balance I'm balancing the values the thickness and thinness of line and allowing the drawing every once in a while to fade back naturally so that I can get a clear view of it again a lot of that fading back that you're seeing now is going to stay the sfumato that Leonardo da Vinci gave us and said you can be the new optics you can be the artist that allows even within a figure like this for atmospheric perspective to happen we don't have to be on top of a mountain to use it we can do whatever we like and that's what made the Mona Lisa such a sensation that it was no longer all these hard edges bumping against other hard edges we had mist within the figure itself look how the edge is almost practically missing from that thigh with the drop shadow lens there's still a line there but it's starting to disappear visually because everything else around it is stronger and it feels like it's in a distance so lost edges are incredible things they really are and Richard Smith the painter sometimes I look at his work even though I know what he's doing it's almost incomprehensible to me how he made the right choice every time just sensational incredible work and so study study 
Study those that inspire. Study those that show us the way, like Leonardo da Vinci did. And add it to your toolkit. Add it to whatever it is you're doing. And then you will inspire others. It always astounds me when people tell me they're inspired by my work. Because I'm still inspired by someone else's work. Now look at this beautiful stuff that's happening here. I'm using the scapula as the wing bone that these wings need to be on for the arms to flap and the wings to continue on that flapping idea. It's a funny idea of someone flapping their arms and trying to fly, but that's what they're doing. They're trying to imitate a bird. Now the arms would be the wings on a bird. Birds don't have arms and their arms come off the scapula in a different direction. So you could pull the wings off from the wrist and have wings like that. That's a nice fantasy idea. And I see it often. But for me, I like the idea that this creature has arms and wings. And that's, for me, much more fanciful and fantastic. I can imagine this not working so much on a male figure, but on a female figure. I can see that because of the lightness of her frame, she has a bird-like Rib cage, for instance, where a man has a big, solid Roman soldier rib cage, a big, wide thing. It'd be hard to imagine these wings lifting that person off the ground. But here we can very clearly see that it could happen with Alana's bird like structure. And also, the power in her arms for her to move around would be also doable for the wings to attach all the way along the underarm down to the wrist. So with fantasy, we have lots of opportunity to do as we please. To have wings coming off someone's head would be bizarre. But you never know. It could work, but it would look comical, I think. Try everything. See what you can get. Using the eraser here now to find rhythms within those gossamer wings. So the closer you get to wherever something is coming from, just like water, imagine that the ripples are tighter, closer to the shore, and then they spread out if you dropped a rock in the water, or just a rock dropped in the center of water, and watch the rings get wider and wider. And that's what I'm doing here for these wings. Tighter ripples, and as it comes out and expands, wider and wider. little light reflection from these wings. So I'm imagining them as very transparent and catching light and reflecting light onto the figure. Now, I normally don't work with backlight because I find it is overdone usually. But when it's required, like here, it really works. You can see how that figure is now reflecting the wings and Taking away the idea that the wings might be just stuck on and not real. By reflecting the wings in the figure, we say this belongs to that. Look what it's doing. It's affecting this by being there. Now here's the mono eraser to carve into those harder edges. We don't want it to be too fluffy. My intention here is to get softer as we get further away from the figure. And that also gives us a halo effect. It feels that we've got a pool of light where the contrast is going to be highest in the center and fade out around the outskirts. And that's a common thing that you'll see in Disney and Pixar and anywhere that's trying to create a magical idea where our eye isn't strained by extraneous detail. It's focused within a certain area and everything else fades out. And it is a beautiful thing that I've explored through all my art life. And it always works for me. When I am overstimulated visually, it's when I'm in a shopping mall and it's mirrors and lights everywhere. It gives me quite a headache. And this doesn't. So I want to get into the realms of fantasy and draw the viewer in not confuse them with too much detail and too much light bouncing off of everywhere. So 
So very cautious with bunch light or backlight, whatever you like to call it, or reflected light, but here it works. Going in with these very fine lines to get some idea of veins within that structure as well. If we don't pay attention to details like that, then they may look like a Halloween costume. It's very unusual to see a Halloween costume that has veins in it. <laughs> it would probably scare the children. But that's what I want here. I want to feel that this is a live thing, not just an appendage stuck on. And also feel in the gravity as well. And so that's why I do the figure first. With the figure I'm exploring, the gravity of the figure, how it compresses against a surface. And then if I add something like the wings, then I echo that compression in the wings based on the knowledge that I've gained from the pose and the knowledge, obviously, that I've gained over many years. But within the pose itself, you're better, I believe, to draw the figure first and add the fantasy elements later, not do them all at once. That's just me, though. You might have a penchant and a, a talent for that. But for me, this works better from experience. Draw what we have reference of, then we can explore the light, and then add the fantasy element based on that light. Makes sense to me. Now look how beautiful that light is now, that I've over-accentuated the highlight on the breast, for instance. And see how the shadow is more dramatic and intense? and less muddy than the reference is. In the reference we have a lot of abstract shapes in there, in that area, and they don't make too much sense. And you know, you start to pull out faces, for instance, like the breast looks like a nose to me, the under part of the arm looks like an eye, and the ribs look like a silly little smile. That could be a little snowman with a long face smiling at us, and I don't want that. That's in the reference. I've taken that idea away by curving and making the shadows not so dark and the lights more light. And that's how that's killed that idea. So coming into the hand again there, when the hand drops, the index finger, the middle finger, and the ring finger tend to fall together. And that works for me. Then I can pull the little finger away. So the little finger is the maverick, as usual. But be aware that when the hand falls down, those fingers tend to fall together. When your hand goes up, hold your hand up now in front of your face relaxed, and you'll see that the middle finger and the ring finger come together, and the index finger and the little finger fall away. And all the fingers bow in a little bit, too. And that's hard to read, hard to see. Something you'll have to really attend to in your explorations of the hands. And that's what makes the hands so difficult. There are already these little phalanges, three phalanges for each finger, and each one getting a third smaller each time. And the last third, it's halfway for the fingernail. It shares half and half of that unit. And of course, what I do then is add more to the fingernail for the feminine finger. So a longer finger Still works. Some people have long fingers. Sometimes you look at a hand, that last third is not a, a third smaller. It's actually another half. <laughs> Sounds very complicated. Just basically think that it's one third smaller for each phalange. But add to that last one. Now I'm using a different pencil here. I'm using a little General's pencil that's very easy to find in stores and comes in packs as well. And it's very dark. It doesn't have so much of the broadness of the regular charcoal pencil, but it has a great dark to it. And the reason I use charcoal pencils is they don't shine and they get great gradation. And with graphite, you have to pick a pencil to get the darkest dark out of it. Cycle all the way through H's to HB to H8 and all that business. You get all of this out of one pencil. But with the charcoal pencil, the one that I've been using for the general idea of this, 
my working pencil, which is that little pencil you see with a string on it, where I pull the string back. That is supposed to be non-sharpable. You're supposed to just pull the string back and work, but I don't find it's good enough for that. So I sharpen those. But it only has a certain range to it. And the fact that it doesn't go too dark is perfect for students, because they usually go too dark anyway. And that'll tame that for them. And then when you really want those dark darks, switch over. I'll usually use a pit pencil. But they're not as easy to find. And this is, this is a very easy pencil to find. And I go in there for the darkest darks. So I'm once again exploring the difference between the darkest value in the picture and the darkest values within the figure. So the darkest value in the picture is that hair. And within the figure, it's these little occlusion shadows where flesh meets flesh. And then you can riff off of it to get whatever you want. I'm calling that underneath the arm something to look at by making it darker. So you can think of all art as abstract rather than representational. Because it's all an illusion. None of it is really real. It's all an illusion. So I want to push that illusion more and feel the heaviness of those muscles as gravity pulls for them and says, come down here. And I tell you that story even stronger with these darker lines. So mix your lines up. See what you can get out of them. And that is what style is. Style is the choices you make. And with every choice that you make, you're saying, this is what I like. And the more you add those together, the more someone else will pop their head up and go, I like what you like. And there's your collector. And there's your admirer. And there's your next art friend that wants to do what you do and do it their way. And hopefully in the future, we'll be so inspired that they'll tell you that you were their inspiration. And that's a great feeling. It really is. And I give those affirmations to every artist that's inspired me. And at the end of the day, no matter what inspiration you have pulled from one, two, three, four, five artists, at the end of the day, you have your own unique style based on all those inspirations. Because remember, they too did the same thing. So feel in these dark darks as much as I can with this pencil. And once again, doing it holistically, going over the entire figure, standing back at arm's length to see these changes. And I'm doing what I've been doing all the way through this. I've been balancing rhythm and gesture, line widths, values, sweep gesture, pencil thin and thick throughout the figure. To put it simpler, I haven't gone from top left to bottom right and rendered the figure equally all the way through. That will create a style, a very tight, realistic style. But if we all just do that, then all our work looks exactly the same. By working holistically, we're more likely to find a style. So here I'm dropping some lines in there as well. I never lose sight of the fact that this is a drawing. And every once in a while I want to throw a couple of lines in. So I don't have perfect gradations all the way through. I'm doing it at the back of the hair here. I'll tend to do it in a place that is already abstract. Hair for me is abstract. That's why I said earlier, part of the picture that is darkest. Because I consider, even though the hair is part of the figure, the figure for me is the muscles and bones. And the hair for me is another component, almost like clothes are, to abstractly go in and change as much as I like. With the figure, we can change it as much as we like too, but only to a degree if we're trying to show a certain amount of realism. Like I've made the forearm bigger here, wherever I feel it needs it. But it's not so much that it's Popeye's forearm, then it becomes comical, it becomes something very strange. So I want to feel that she could jump and grab things with those arms without being a muscly bodybuilding man. All that femininity is still in there. 
thinking of the rhythmic creases there of where the iliac crest would press against the obliques. Every time we bend forward, we crease. We fold right above the navel, and going forward far enough, we'll fold on the navel. So we'll see one crease or two, depending on how far forward we fold. The creases we're seeing at the bottom here are radiating away from that iliac crest. And I'm overdoing them a little bit. But I want to feel that rhythm. I want to feel that torque. And I have added a little bit of the back coming in near the sacrum. This is the most extreme, almost, pinch and stretch idea where we bring our arms forward and curve that back almost like we're doing a dance, this big rhythmic dance. And it's a good way to think of the body dancing regardless of what position it's in. And I imagine Alan is about to move here. And that's what this pose came from. It came from lots of emotions. I would give Alana an emotion and she would dance into it or fall into it and move into another emotion. And this was all about insecurity, all about feeling that she wants to withdraw from the world. And she pulled her knees up and curved her back into a fetal position. And that's how this begat the idea. So not every idea comes first. We can be inspired by the pose, and I do that often. If I see a particular pose, I ask myself, what is the model feeling here? And how can I translate that into fantasy? And this came to mind, obviously. So instead of withdrawing, she's actually coming out of something. She's being born rather than trying to go back into that unborn state. So as I've said before, you'll get used to the pencil. And you can see it's getting smaller, smaller and smaller, that little stump of a pencil. Sometimes the pencil can be too sharp. I have them in various states just under the screen here. And if it's too sharp, then you can get too thin a line. And it informs the drawing in a different way. And actually, we end up being influenced by the pencil itself and doing lines that are too thin for what we want. So we've got to be aware of that. Now, as I get into this last third of the drawing, in time that is, then we can start to see the style develop and think more of the parts. Because we've holistically drawn everything in, I can now zoom in if I need to on a certain aspect and not worry about losing the holistic nature too much. And that's why I can go in here now and find micro rhythms of jewelry, for instance. And when I'm drawing those little beads in, I'm thinking of the curve of the head. It's very easy to draw a straight line there and not consider it. And with this little mono eraser, I'm always thinking about drawing. I'll always be drawing. Drawing these little highlights in as rhythms rather than just highlights. Finding the edges of things. Remember, a highlight is an edge. It's the corner of something. And it's the highest corner of something that catches the light. So I'm going right onto the edge of these wings where the corner is and adding those highlights. You saw me rub the debris away and it doesn't smudge the drawing like you would think it does. Because with every layer, and it is layers, it doesn't seem like it, but it is. With every layer, we're pushing that charcoal into the surface a little bit more and embedding it, even within newsprint. You would think newsprint is so smooth it doesn't have a tooth to it, meaning a texture that charcoal can grab onto. But it does. And so as I go forward, there's less and less worry of that. Not that I ever do worry. I actually like a dirty surface. It means there's more for the eraser to carve into. So worry not too much. But as you're beginning, try and keep your hand light. And then later it'll lighten up by itself anyway.
All right, back in with the paper stamp. What I want to do now is place the character into a background, but I don't want the background to dominate the figure. The story is all about the figure metamorphosing here. If I start putting a big city in the background, it'll distract from the figure. Now I also want to make those wings read, and if they're white against white, that may not happen. So I put in some charcoal with the paper stump and smudged it here with a tissue. And it gives me, as usual, that lovely organic dark and light throughout. Now the shadow under the figure already placed it in some kind of space, rather than just floating there. But what this little organic textured background does is places it in space and also within an environment that doesn't have to be detailed in any way at all. The only detail I'm putting in here is the random textures created by the kneadable eraser. And the way I create those textures is to flatten the eraser out almost like a lumpy pie and then just clump it around but as I do I reshape it with every clump otherwise it repeats itself. It has repeated itself a little bit there just at the top near the wing but nothing too serious and when it's just a little bit like that it can actually be okay as a rhythm but generally if it keeps repeating then it ends up looking like a Photoshop stamp tool, a clone tool. So I'm very aware of that. And as I'm more aware of digital tools, I'm more aware of not making my art look anywhere like that at any point. So I'm trying to keep away from any resemblance to anything other than traditional drawing. And that way we create an old world look to the drawing and we're not influenced by the textures and the stamp of the tools reminding us of anything else rather than the drawing itself. So I'm trying to keep this drawing organic. And coming in for these dark darks once again with that beautiful little black general's pencil. The reason I'm not using the pit is I just don't have one at hand. Otherwise, that would be a pit pencil. So this is my go-to. When times get lean, I can just pick that pencil up. It actually came in a little gift box, and that's how I discovered it. I'm glad it did. In some ways, you get too set in your ways and never explore anything other than the tools you've known to work. And so that's been a nice little find right there. And coming back in again with my workhorse, which is the Sketch and Peel. And I actually like it better than the more expensive pencils, because it's less gritty. The Conte pencils are beautiful, they really are. But they get a lot of grit in them. And I want to be encumbered by the pencil. I don't want to stop to sharpen a pencil that has a bit of grit in it. These seem to be grit free which is incredible technology for a pencil, considering that it is organic charcoal, compressed and binded together with a little bit of gum. So feeling once again all of these moments that work and bouncing back and forth to the darks now. And you can see up close how beautiful a drawing can be and why collectors love them so much that you can get in there with a magnifying glass and really see that it's a drawing that's been done by a human. It has a quality like nothing else and it is a beautiful thing that for me will always have the artist's hand in it and no other mark on this was made by any other mechanical means. So drawings are treasured and always will be treasured. And I want to make sure that I keep it looking like a drawing. So the paper stump again. I want to put enough dark and shadow around this figure to make it pop without going too dark, as in the reference. And it's starting to happen now. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm trying to feel just how much value I want on the outside of the figure. 
to make the figure work against its abstract environment. And feeling those little gestural lines that get lost, the pentimento, they get lost along the way when we get too precise. And we can bring them back with the stump and get that little animation thing happening again, a reverberation or echo of the form itself. And doing a little bit of the old master stuff here, just cutting in with the eraser to separate the art from the background. And that's something that isn't seen in real life, only through optics, through a lens, for instance, you'll see that. And so if we don't understand how optics work or use the tools available to us as artists, we end up drawing very flat drawings. And Frank Frazetta used that a lot in his paintings. He would put a light just against the dark of the figure as it reached the background. And Rembrandt did it too. I look at the old masters and I can see it. But I grew up with Frazetta as my first influence. Well, Boris Vallier who was my first influence. But Frazetta came sharply after that and showed more technique than Boris did. Boris's technique was so polished that you couldn't actually see how it was done. You can just say, that's incredible, I can't believe it. But with Frank, you could actually zoom in and have a look at his work and see how it was done because he left the organic nature of it behind. And that's one of the things I gleaned from him and then saw it in the old masters. It's basically, put it in a simple way, a light against the dark will make anything pop. What's asked of me all the time, how do we draw jewellery? And I don't put it on the model, I draw it later. And I want it to follow the form. And that's why it's useful to do those contour lines over and over. Ask yourself what way is the arm coming at us? Is it coming toward us or away from us? Here the forearm is going away from us. And the upper arm is coming toward us a little bit. But what I'm concerned with here is the curve of the jewelry within that arm. Now if the arm was going straight ahead on the 2D plane, then that bracelet would be almost a straight line and that wouldn't work for dimension. It would look non-dimensional. It would look up and down straight ahead and destroy the illusion of dimension. Now look how quickly it becomes metallic just by putting higher lights on where the arm would have a higher light, but doubling that light and putting a dark where the dark of the arm would be and doubling that dark or near to it. And there we go. How simple is that? And it's easier to do than to put that stuff on the model. Now you could do it. You could put it all on the model and it'd be a wonderful thing. But for me, I have all the freedom in the world now to put any kind of jewelry I want on here. And by putting those darks right against the flesh gives the impression that the flesh is pinching into that jewelry. And we don't often see that on jewelry when a model wears it because sometimes it's a bit too loose. It's never as form-fitting as we can make it. And then it becomes a non-realistic thing, meaning we don't believe it. Not that it doesn't look realistic in the render. We just don't believe she's wearing it the way someone from this time, which is timeless, would wear it, so it wouldn't be slipping off all the time. Now get it in tight against that forehead to feel that pressure. And we can do it with just line. And that line is me exploring now, up close, for one of the few times that I get an up close, how I can exploit the pencil marks and the darks and lights and make it work as a drawing up close as well as from far away. Because the collectors will get in close and enjoy all of that beautiful stuff in the quiet of their den or wherever they put their art. And I've been to many collectors' homes and see that it's always in a place of serenity, somewhere that they can go and listen to music or have no other distractions. It's rarely in a place where there's a television, for instance. 
usually a study where you go and read or write and every once in a while look up and see the artwork or take a break and just enjoy it and knowing that makes art for me such a pleasure to do knowing that it's going to be enjoyed so much by another person and it's a great affirmation for what we do that people will lay down their hard-earned money to buy what they believe is unique and precious to them and it's as unique and precious to me now obviously I could keep all of these drawings and look at them myself but the thought that someone else is going to see it with a fresh eye is actually more exciting to me and every once in a while I'll go and see an artwork that I haven't seen for years in a collector's place and see it with their eyes for the first time because I haven't seen it for years and I can sort of feel what they feel and that's incredible Now I'm moving along here with a mono eraser and doing it rhythmically, carving in to the dark that's already there. And just catching the edges, remember that idea again, that an edge is a corner. And just rubbing a little harder into that edge to get that highlight glint. Now that looks like I'm rubbing in hard there. Remember this is newsprint, so it's very fragile, very easy to break the surface and make a hole. So remember to lighten up your hand when you're doing this for the first time and do it in layered ideas. Don't try and get it all erased in one hit or you may cut into the surface. Now note that the rhythm of these golden pennies that are in her hair are curving around the form of the head as usual. When it comes to hair I tend not to draw every strand. It always looks amateurish to me. And it's too much detail. The more detail you put in, the more people are going to look in that area. Is the hair really that important? Or is it the emotion? For me, it's the emotion. And so that goes into the hands and face. And the body, the way it turns, the way it tenses. The hair for me is a wonderful abstract idea that can flow and add to the form but if we take away from the form by putting every strand of hair in then we're losing the plot a little bit there maybe sometime somewhere along in the future the hair will be for me a moment in the picture where it's the most important thing but it hasn't come to that yet maybe i'll design a creature whose hair is alive and then it will be but for now I do as Sargent did, as all the artists that I really admired did, Waterhouse for instance. They never painted every strand of hair, ever. It was always in clumps. Now if you can't divorce yourself from that, just don't zoom in. Don't zoom in so you can see every strand. Or do what artists have always done, and just squint. Squint at the artwork, and it will become a simpler idea. And here's why I love hair. I can go in there and gesturize the outskirts of it and nobody's going to take me to task for it they might do if I do it around the fingers because it might look like an extra finger but not in the hair so the hair gives us the chance to be animated again and show that this is a drawing again by taking away any idea of photorealistic render now we can add some realism in there, you can add realism all the way through it if you like, but for me, talking about style and my style, I don't. I keep it realistic, but not photorealistic. Notice that I took just one of those little pennies and shaved away all of the grey to show that that penny itself has turned and faced the light and caught the full glint of the sun. If I did it for every one of those, then that would negate that idea and it would just look like holes in the paper. So one only, and we get that wonderful change. So change those rhythms up, add a highlight to one and maybe a dark surface to the other. The one that's closest to the face is darker than the one at the back. So make sure those little objects are changing as they go along to reflect the organic nature once again of the art 
and the organic nature of life. Things are never exactly the same. So feeling a rhythm within the forearm here, just by using a needable eraser. And what I'm doing is echoing the contours that would tell you that arm's gone away from us. Once again, it's a drawing idea. It's not representative of the photo reference. All right, now, time to bring this whole thing together with the idea of softness against hardness, light against dark, and the holistic nature and flow of all of these tones, all of these values, all of these marks, bring them all together, bring them home, if you like, into one piece of art. It's been very hard to divorce myself away from the photo reference and it's hard for all artists and especially the beginner who tends to render exactly what they see throughout. So my advice is to stand back as often as you can, squint as often as you can to see if you can simplify the forms. But more importantly what I'm doing here is find the rhythm again near the end, especially at the render. That's when we lose the rhythm. That's when we lose the flow and the gesture. So arm's length again. Stepping back, getting a whole feel for it. Find the those moments you loved again. Re-love them. Recurve a curve. Re-darken a dark. But make it better each time. Every time I go over in a line, it's not just making it darker. It's making it a better line in some way. I'm thinking of more compression if it's compressed, more curve if it's curvy. If something feels a little bit too curved, I'll put a straight on it and feel if that makes a difference and put the curve back in if it doesn't help. All of that stuff's going on right now. I'm examining, exploring, analyzing, understanding, and redrawing what I'm seeing. And if you keep a really keen eye on this, you'll just notice there that I've darkened in a half light idea that thigh all the way up and by contrast the ribs have now lit up because of that thought. So every mark should be a thought. Every tone should be a thought. Everything is about the drawing here. How can I enhance it without over rendering it and destroying it? Now, most of my drawings do get a little bit destroyed by the end if I'm in render hell. That's why I'm so aware of render hell. It has killed many a drawing. But we'll see. It's easy with a document like this to go back in time and see if it did get worse as it went along. But for now, as we fight this fight, if we keep on thinking and keep on making things as best we can, then we're going to get more wins than losses. And if at the end of it, it could have been better 10 minutes before, that's okay. We can learn that next time when we get to that same position again. Because mileage informs us each time what worked and what didn't work. And here we're getting lots of success in this drawing. Now, sometimes you'll find that your charcoal is going down and not staying on. That might be the time to use your reworkable fixative if you want. But for me, I'm not too worried. I press into it with my finger and it embeds it further in. It depends how much dark you want. Now I get more dark there and these are like layers. You can see that it's going in. It's giving me a nice organic sort of pit nature to it as I do it. And look at the difference between lines here. Look how we've got that atmospheric perspective of the other breast, even though it's not that far away, and how beautiful that idea is. Rather than just white abstract shape you can see on the reference, which is actually distracting and weird looking. It doesn't work at all as two breasts. So the reference is not the boss of us. And by constantly thinking of the drawing now, and looking less at the reference, then we get a drawing that has its own life and becomes its own thing. That's what I want here. I want this drawing to live alone without the ghost of the reference haunting it all the way through. Even as I do these organic shapes here, if you look at the reference again, 
that line seems to be going straight up and I want it to ripple more and break the shadow also so it doesn't look like it's a graphic shape. You can put graphics in if you want, but for me that's what I don't want. What you have to say to yourself is, do I want this? Or am I being ruled by the reference that I'm looking at? Once you make your choice, then the drawing comes alive. So don't be frightened of the reference. Don't let it tell you that you can't change it. Change it as much as you want. And change it as much as you can. And you'll get a better drawing every single time. You'll get more of who you are more of what you want and who doesn't want that to be in total charge of the drawing it's a tough thing to do when you're starting out but see if you can find something that you're good at maybe you've drawn the arm lots and then make that arm your little project where you put lots of gesture in it and if the foot is tough for you then keep on working on the foot in the background and maybe make it a little bit of a faded out area like we have there until you understand it further. Now feeling that calcaneus is a hard edge. It's very easy to draw the calcaneus which is the heel bone as a round lump. That's how it first appears but by putting that hard edge on it up to that Achilles tendon, we get a much more informed and solid foot. The foot is a problem because it has that arch and ends up looking like a bean compressed in the middle if we're not too careful. And it's actually a bit too round there for now. But I'm always scooting across the figure and keeping in mind what is fresh to me as I move from one place to another. If we just concentrate on one area at a time, we end up losing that fresh eye. We get too close to what we're doing and get too caught up in render. All right, feeling that lovely stump, bringing about the contour of the leg in a very simple way. I don't have to put tons of render in there. Just by rhythmically going through with this stump, it feels like there's a curve to that leg without minutia of detail. So contour, look for it and find it and run with it. Try to draw this as if it's a 3D object and curve across all of the forms with your pencils and your other tools as if you are climbing these peaks like an ant and understanding the corners and the curves. Now on to the magic of it, the magic elements. Let's get our most <laughs> high-tech tool on, which is the electric eraser, which is basically just a battery-powered eraser. It spins at the end and really brings on highlights like nothing else. Because it runs on a wheel though, you got to be very careful not to run across your entire drawing with it. So test it on the side first before you go in like this. And then go for your life. Now this is a tricky one for me to do because it's kind of fairy dust, isn't it? And I certainly don't want to fall into that realm of being a fairy painter. Not that there's anything wrong with it. I love those fairy paintings, but it's not my realm. I'm the mermaid guy. I draw things that are a little bit more adult in nature. And so I want to maintain that. And so skipping a fine line here with this sparkly, magical nature. But I love it. It's great and it's working. And I think the juxtaposition of the idea of this being a light-hearted fairy thing, along with what I'm known as, which is a realist, to some degree, painter of flesh and tone, means that this is something fresh again. So if we can mix up the genres, even though the fairy dust 
belongs in the same genre as fantasy. There's fantasy genres within these genres, and for me, that's a different thing. But it's working here if I mash them up and don't go too far into it. Arthur Reckham would probably be a, a good source of what I'm trying to get across here. If you look at his work, it's quite dark at times, even though it was children's books. And the Victorian artists did go quite dark. There's moments of darkness in Peter Pan, for instance, where Peter Pan takes a turn and becomes quite sinister and almost terrifying to Wendy when he comes out of the dark. And that gets lost a little bit. It's been sanitized over the years. And it's part of what I really loved about those childhood memories. I remember being very frightened of Pinocchio when they turned into the donkeys and you saw their shadows on the wall as the he hawed. It was terrifying to me as a kid, but not so much that I had to get psychotherapy or anything like that. So I'm drawing for an adult audience, really. And so I don't want to go too far into the tiptoeing through the daisies thing. But it's working. And it's working well. And I'm happy with it. And if it didn't, then I would have to start thinking about how much of that I'm, am I going to take out? Or is there an alternative to showing that this isn't just metamorphosis, but something magical? Something that has to do more with the mystic rather than natural birth cycle. And it's also adding something else. It's adding interest to the actual drawing by its very contrast. And it's also bringing in the elements of the background to the foreground. And that's why I overran the figure with some of those light sources. Because it can look very stuck on, a figure, if we don't bring some of the elements of the background in. I'm doing my usual trick here of signing the picture before it's finished. And that automatically shows me everything that's wrong with it. It's just a magical thing. Magic drawing, magical technique. And so by coming in now, after signing that, I see automatically what needs to be done. It's remarkable, really. And it was from before. Those curved edges of the foot were just too curvy. And I'm putting a harder edge on to bring back that sturdiness of the foot. Foot can be a real problem in that if there's too much detail on the foot, it draws our attention away from what's important. And that's the reason Frank Frazetta said he didn't draw feet. They just distract from the storytelling, from the figure itself even. So that's why I'm fading them into mist there. I actually love drawing feet. But they can be, as Frank said, a distraction. And so I'm very aware of that. It's because they are on the outskirts, the peripheral of the figure. And the very nature of fantasy for me is to fade the edges of any painting or drawing to bring the focus back into the picture. Because if we have extreme detail on the end of a picture, our eye will just go straight to whatever the toe is pointing at. And if it's in a gallery, it's going to point to another picture. And maybe you've pointed that toe to the sale of someone else's artwork. That's a cutthroat way of looking at it. But as a compositional idea, it is a flawed idea to have things point out of the picture. Because you'll lose your audience. So when it comes to composition, I'm always thinking of a circular or rhythmic idea to bring everything back in, in a spiral nature. A composition can be the idea of rule of thirds, but I'm not too keen on that because I see it now in pictures all the time, even though it works, I see it. And so those pictures aren't as fresh to me as the idea of designing with rhythm. And if you design with rhythm and rhythm being so random, then the picture is always fresh. And you can say that that's a blueprint underneath that we don't see because you can't actually cite it. You can't put the rule of thirds on top of it and say, Look, this artist has used the rule of thirds. It's too organic for that. And therefore the freshness remains forever. It's eternal. That's a tricky thing to do. 
but see if you can see it in this drawing. There's a rhythm running all the way up that wing and across the shoulder and all the way down to the wrist. And then finishes at the little finger end that touches the foot right there. Not the pinky finger, just the, the smallest finger in the composition. And I do that all the way through. I try and link one to the other. Now, one thing I did see with a fresh eye here was that the bracelet that I'd put on was not so gestural and not as gestural as the figure. And we can't have that. And so I'm adding a little bit to it. I'm not referencing any jewelry. I just spent lots of time over my career understanding how it works. And that gives me a freshness to the jewelry as well. So the highest lights should be higher than any light in the figure, in the flesh. And note how carving into that hard shadow really made that feel like metal. So it looks like I'm drawing very fast here. It's just a clarity of thought. I've done it so many times and I understand it. And so I can paint and draw this metal stuff without reference. And that makes me happy because I can concentrate on the flow of it rather than the mechanics of it. You can see I almost went into the detail hand there to find gesture and was very aware of it. I want gesture and for the detail hand I'll put in some structure. And that's how I'm working with that carpal edge there. So caught me on the hop. And after a while you'll develop spider senses that'll tell you when it's time to change from one mode to the other. Now think of that long line of the surface that this creature's lying on or sitting on. And it grounds it and really makes it feel that she's more balanced as well. The beauty of the balance juxtaposed with the gesture of the figure makes this something that seems so alive that we can forget sometimes that it's actually just lines and tongue. It is the illusion of movement. And I want that illusion of movement as much as I can in my fantasy female figures. Because the freshness is forever if we can do that. And it's a tricky one to do. And that's why I'm leaving these long rendered poses to the end. We should always start with short poses and end with rendered poses. To do it the opposite way would be a disastrous idea in my mind. We got to get the gesture flowing from the short poses and transfer it into the long poses by working them last. Now this is still flesh that we're dealing with here. And so I have squeezed that little kneadable eraser down to its finest point to cut into small edges and small wrinkles to give the appearance of crinkled flesh. Think of the flesh as a suit that we wear and where we bend, it will crease. We don't want big lumpy creases because the thin skin is not thick enough to have big lumpy creases unless it's a big area like the tensor fascia latte there. Where we crease around the stomach it's going to have finer creases and one of the things I do in my oil paintings is to come in at the end and just put some very fine lines along the edges of the pubic bone because we crease there in very fine lines. It's not a big fold over at that point. And you'll see it on people, especially when they sunbathe. When they get up from sunbathing, you'll see very fine lines there where the flesh has been creased and the sun didn't get there. And I'll bring that idea into the flesh of the thigh as well, just for rhythm. Remembering all the time that it's just a drawing. It's not a photorealistic rendering. And that can be a drawing of two, of course. But that's not my idea. So finding harder edges here and thinking of that mountainous terrain, the idea that this is a dimensional idea, and using my anatomical knowledge to find that Anconius again, 
the ulna and the medial epicondyle, the inside funny bone, and just carving into it a little bit more and adding more value than we see in the picture. Because I don't feel the curve of that flexor muscle as much as I do when I'm drawing these extra values. I don't feel it in the reference. The reference feels a little flat there at that area. And so more value will heighten that box shape where the ulna divides the carpal masses. Flexor carpi ulnaris and the extensor carpi ulnaris. I really love how drawing is different from photography that we can go in and hyper gesturize even the smallest forms and just draw what we please and find in those little lights and darks this is the time when I can go in and enjoy the detail so if you ever think I despise detail or something like that I don't I love it but go in too soon with detail and we kill the gesture. Once we have the gesture in, we can detail all we like, but still be aware that we can end up in detail hell. So these hells I talk about are very real. And render is the toughest one. If we render ourselves out of a bad drawing, it'll always be a bad drawing. It'll have a sickly feel to it, where the render has covered up mistakes, but we still feel there's something wrong. And that's why for me, render hell is the worst hell to be in. With structure hell and gestural hell, we can see the structure hell right away, and we know it's wrong. With gestural hell, everything becomes very, very wobbly, but it still looks pretty nice. So if I'm going to err on one way to draw, it's going to be in the gestural domain. Because that always feels fresh to me. But it can be hellish, and that's why... I had to come in and put a harder edge on that calcaneus because that was a micro gestural hell happening right there. So just be aware of them, but don't fear them. Don't even demonize them. Just say, oh, this is a good landmark, a good goalpost for me to say, oh, there's what happened right there. And be, through that awareness, able to change a gesture into a structure or a structure into a gesture. And a bit of both, as I put structure on that knee, of course that's where we put structure, where the bones are. The bones are harder, they've got harder edges. And so if you're not sure where to put the structure, look for the bone land masses. Look for what comes to the surface and what is hard as opposed to soft. I'm using the kneadable eraser here in a way that can only be explained as you do it, really. Because I can't tell you how hard to erase here, and I'm erasing very softly to get a stripe through that hair that echoes the little pennies of gold. And I've changed the idea of the pennies. I've decided I don't want them. I'm going to make them an organic tweed of some kind, a plait of some kind, or even just an alien shape within the hair. Maybe it's a gold paint that runs through the hair. That's what I'm doing. And it's bringing the drawing to life. It's making it unique because I've never seen that before. And for me, that is coming from the beauty of gesture almost solely. I want a gesture in that hair and I was going for it with any means at all. Even if it meant saying, I'm going to do something that's totally unusual and strange. In fact, that's the making of it. And it's the making of this drawing for me now. And sometimes that comes at the last minute. In fact, often, when you're more confident from having hit all the marks and being a good guy, <laughs> put it all in the way you should have done before you can enjoy the dessert, being a good person rather than gorge on that final gratification all the way through, I've made sure the drawing is not a load of gimmicks. And at the end now, I have earned the right to put this in. And then it goes, and 
it is the freshest thing, because even I didn't see it. And that's what I love about art, especially fantasy art, is that when we start this thing, we don't know what's going to end at this. We can do color roughs, but it's still not going to be anything like the paint at the end. You can squint your eyes and say it is. But when the paint goes on, or the pencil goes on like this, the unexpected happens often. And for that to happen, we got to keep our minds open. And always, during the drawing process or the painting process, be open to change. And it's that change that usually is the big bravura end to something and makes the entire thing sing. So for me, that last moment decision there, after the signature, of course, is what brought this entire thing to life because it brought some of the magic that's in the wings into the hair. And we don't end up with wings that look stuck on. We have a magical rhythm all the way through. And that's what this drawing's been about, finding magical rhythm and gesture throughout a drawing. And I'm looking forward to now seeing you in the next episode where we do some due diligence and on to a final render drawing again. Good luck with your own drawings.